So, I've been playing the second closed beta test for Wuthering Ways for about a month now, gone to late game doing dailies on my work days, and streaming on long sessions on weekends. Basically how I'd play the game day to day. And I've decided it's about time I make an in-depth video on my thoughts before I forget, and give my feedback and suggestions to the developers while also helping players make a decision on if the game is worth sinking time into once it officially launches. I actually wanted to make a first impressions video about the game like literally everyone else, but decided against it since it would basically be repeating similar opinions that I've had since playing CBT1 last year, there wasn't any super dramatic changes, and I was also busy with PGR at the time. But after many days and nights on the toilet, in the shower, in my dreams, and slacking off at work, I've cooked up and summarized my honest thoughts and suggestions on the second closed beta test into this video. And for those who don't know my background, I've played Punishing Grey Raven, Kuro's previous game, competitively for almost 3 years, and my channel is mainly focused on providing informative videos for that game. Safe to say, I've spent a lot of time and money on Kuro games, but please don't ask how much, I don't want to talk about it. Also, drop us a subscribe if you want to see future Wuthering Waves and PGR videos, and let's get into it. Starting with where I stand with Wuthering Waves, I'll rate it in 4 parts, the story, the visuals and sound, the gameplay, and the game systems. Also, I'll leave timestamps if you want to just see a specific topic. Starting with the story, the main storyline was kind of meh. Nothing terrible, but nothing super memorable either. With all the technical terms being used in the dialogue, I was honestly kind of put off by it. Personally, I prefer the story to show rather than tell me when possible, because sometimes a scene or an emotion or even a soundtrack is worth more than a thousand words. That being said, I actually really enjoyed the Ling Yang quest. I learned a lot about his personality and backstory, and went from being indifferent to his character to actually being quite attached. The story domain was also unique and fun with the platforming mode, and Jin Yan's quest was also alright but nothing to write home about. Of course, not all quests are made equal, and the NPC quests are just whatever, but that's a skip button moment so thank god we have that. And the story overall is okay in my opinion, it's better than in CBT1, but despite being totally revamped, it still feels like it's missing some life to it. Like it feels hollow most of the time, I couldn't really get attached to the characters, and the plot wasn't really super clear, maybe because I skipped a lot, who knows. And outside of the story boss fights, it didn't really feel engaging, so kind of a meh moment for me. Now talking about the character design, I think it's improved quite a bit compared to CBT1, and the camera angles are definitely making you notice. Is it peak design though? Not exactly, but it's pretty good. Coming from Punishing Grey Raven, these designs are very tame compared to what Kuro has made in terms of skins and character designs in PGR. For example, Luna's glow up from her base ascendant form to her recent skins, I can 100% see future skins or characters in Wuthering Waves getting more intricate or flashy, and we know that they have the potential, we'll just have to wait and see. And as for the world design, the main gripe I had with CBT1 was the muted look of the world, which I kinda understand that's what they're trying to go for, but personally, I wanted to explore a kind of more brighter world, but still have that post-apocalyptic setting in a way. If I wanted to explore like a really dark gloomy world, I'd just go outside. But I think Kuro nailed the world in the second closed beta test. The color palette feels more vivid, but doesn't take away from the post-apocalyptic feel. The milky sky is jaw-dropping at night, and seeing the sunrise in the morning on top of a mountain is indescribable. The landscapes themselves curve and flow in abnormal ways to create an unworldly, well, world. But with the movement system of Wuthering Waves allowing you to run up walls, flip, wall run, grapple, and glide from like anything is a breath of fresh air. It makes any cliff, wall, or building feel scalable, and it really allows you to truly explore every corner of the world. The Wuthering Waves movement system feels less like Genshin or Breath of the Wild, and more akin to something like Warframe or Timefall 2, where movement is the key to the game. So, my kudos to Kuro Games for implementing this. I also love the many grapple points to zip around in the city, it's a really underrated design, and it was one of my favorite parts of Sumeru and Genshin, so along with the multiple teleport points, it doesn't really feel agonizing to get around places in Wuthering Waves. And I want to quickly touch on sound design, I think the combat music is hype as hell, and when you get the adrenaline pumping from the pairing and dodging enemy attacks, it feels like it fits perfectly. The overworld music is also very nice, when entering some creepy areas it has a certain eerie feeling to it, but when entering like the city it's very peaceful and lively. And the sound effects for the dodge and parry are just perfect. The gameplay I think is the best part of the game, the combat is fluid and satisfying, even more so than in CBT1. Although then again we have 120 FPS in this CBT compared to the 60 in the last one. When you're zoned in, it really feels like you're not really even playing a gacha game, but you're playing more like Monster Hunter or a Souls-like game. In a fight, you're focused on dodging and keeping track of the enemy, while in the back of your mind you're trying to keep track of the rotation and QTEs for swapping off. 
And speaking of swapping, the swap transition window is a lot smoother than last CVT, and echo abilities and skills are cast even when swapping, so it flows smoothly and you can dodge without worrying about cancelling your skill. The rotation is even more fluid than the last CBT due to the new intro and outro skills, and with every character having their skills, echo abilities, ultimates, and core passive attacks to use, there's minimal ability downtime when swapping through characters, making the rotation flow as easily as water down a river. The audio cue for QTEs is also a great addition, allowing you to focus more on the fight, but know when a character is available to swap in. And honestly, I wish this was added into PGR sometimes. And the addition of the break and toughness bar allows players who are dealing enough damage or properly timing their parries to incapacitate the boss, opening up a damage window. And overall, I really like it. It makes you feel more like you're playing Monster Hunter or Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, where you've earned the free damage window. Every boss has unique attacks you want to learn and damage windows you need to take advantage of, and mastering a boss fight feels great and is one of my favorite parts of the game. I also love the echo abilities themselves, it feels really fun to play, and you can even parry with them if timed right. And their utility and damage is pretty helpful, like some echo abilities synergize really well with certain characters, and overall it opens up a lot of unique combinations. And I just want to say, the grapple is insane in this game, you can use it to dodge and plunge in a fight, mid-air while gliding, even while swimming, or just traversing the world faster. And it's one of the most versatile tools in this game, and I love it. As for the game systems, this is where I had some problems back in the first closed beta test, and some parts of it are better now, but some parts of it I feel like are actually worse compared to CBT1. Let's start with the good parts. They removed the day of the week restrictions on resource domains from CBT1, thank god it was super annoying, and really unnecessary to be honest. They added new open world puzzles, which are not too difficult but not too easy, and they give nice rewards, so I guess that's fine. The addition of outro skills gives each character team buffs, like for example more ultimate energy or basic attack damage when swapping out with full concerto energy. And you'll know you have full concerto energy when you hear the sound indicator or you feel the circle gauge at the bottom left. The system also emphasizes character swapping and it's overall much easier to understand than the CBT1's elemental buff system, so another thumbs up from me. And I think one major improvement that we've had since CBT1 to CBT2 is the Star Rail type daily system. Instead of having the four commission quest dailies that Genshin had, it now has one very fast skippable dialogue daily quest that takes like a minute, which is a very nice improvement. And the rest of the daily tasks can be cleared from just playing the game normally, like farming, fighting enemies, things that you would already do. Overall, it's much faster than CBT1, and it doesn't really take longer than like five to 10 minutes from my experience to do dailies, which is very manageable and important for the longevity of the game. The end game is also really fleshed out for the second closed beta test, they've added more since CBT1, with the Curse Wave or Simulated Universe mode roguelike, along with multiple challenging timed end game modes like the hologram boss fights to limit test your skill and characters, and the Genshin Abyss-like game mode from the last CBT to clear more mobs. It feels satisfying to learn and clear these modes since they're not easy and the rewards feel worthwhile enough to get me motivated. As for the gacha system, it's alright, I don't really want to fully judge the game's pull economy based on the CBT since the amount of pull currency can be different from launch, but from what I've played in the CBT 2, it feels like forever to get enough currency to pull for a limited character, and that's assuming you win the 50-50. But we'll see for sure once this game launches. It costs about 160 pull currency for a single pull, just like in Genshin or Star Rail, but for the overall character banners, there are 80 pity with a 50-50 chance for the limited rate up and no soft pity from what I've seen. And the weapon is also 80 pity, but 100% rate up for the weapon banners. And you can choose the standard weapon rate up to work towards as well. You also get a single use starter banner with standard characters in it, and they have discounted 10 pulls and a lower pity, which is 50 if I recall correctly. But I also do like how you can buy extra copies of characters over time in the shop, albeit it's a long time, but similar to kind of getting shards in PGR from King Cage to get a character from S rank to double S. The co-op is actually the most fun I've ever had in a gacha game, not that it's saying much, but the different attacks you can do on a character, including the swap and attack from both teammates, minimizes downtime, and it's pretty fun. So far, the only need for co-op is hunting the super enemies, which are extremely high level, but drops guaranteed gold echoes, so they're worth doing. So I hope they expand on this into future co-op missions or events, because it was pretty fun. And for the elephant in the room, the echo or gearing system, I think it's a good idea at a conceptual level, but it's just the execution that I have a problem with. I feel like overall it's just too overcomplicated, and honestly it's one of the few downsides of the CBT. Basically you kill monsters to get these echoes which are used as the gear and echo abilities if it's on the main slot. 
you get three sizes of echoes, the common size, which are one cost, elite echoes, which are three cost, and overlord echoes or bosses, which are four cost. And by mid to end game, you cannot equip more than a total cost of 12 for your character build. This is because you need to level up the total cost capacity by absorbing various different echoes and their rarities to level up your Pokedex or databank. And leveling up your databank or Pokedex lets you get higher rarity echoes that can have more substat slots and higher max level, just like in Star Rail or Genshin with their golden artifacts. So to sum up farming echoes or gear for your characters, here's the entire process. Run around and kill enemies hoping they drop an echo because they got like a 20% chance to drop an echo when they die, then hope it's the right main stat you're looking for. One cost echoes can roll three different main stats like attack, defense, or HP, which is fine, but three cost echoes can roll 10 different main stats due to elemental damage bonuses, and four cost echoes can roll seven different main stats, including crit or energy recharge or even healing bonus. Four cost echoes or bosses you can constantly farm, so it's not as bad since they're guaranteed the right set bonus and you can just wait for them to respawn every five minutes until they drop the main stat you want without using stamina. But that can't be said for the three cost elite echoes since you'll spend a lot of time running around the world trying to get one that'll drop the right main stat out of 10 possible choices. I don't know why Withering Waves decided to do this because in Genshin or Star Rail for example, you have certain pieces that can roll multiple different main stats, but you have head pieces or hands that can only give you a single main stat so you can focus on the substats. So now that you've gotten an echo to drop and it's the right main stat, you now need to pray that it's the right set bonus like getting a 3 cost elite echo with an elemental main stat on the wrong elemental bonus set is infuriating, and if I see one more arrow damage bonus main stat on my eye set, I'll scream so loud I'll probably wake up my neighbors. So, assuming you get the echo, you get the right main stat, you get the right set bonus, then you need to make sure it's not the same echo as the one you already have, otherwise the set bonus won't count. And after you go through all of those layers of RNG, then you finally need to roll good substats. And the amount of possible substats in this game is just laughable, as much as around a 3 cost echo, and the substats need to be unlocked with tuners which cost stamina to get, or by unlocking chests. So for example, if I wanted to farm an echo for my Donjin, the possibility that I get an echo to begin with, that has a Havoc damage main stat, on a Havoc set bonus, on the right echo type, with good substats, feels lower than the probability of me pulling a 5 star on the first pull. It's not impossible, it just feels improbable. And actually, back in CBT1, it was much easier to get the set bonus since a certain enemy could only be part of one type of set, so you would just hunt that specific enemy until you got the right main stat. Overall, I feel like there's just too many layers of RNG, and I really don't understand that substat tuner system. It feels really unnecessary, and it feels like I just have to burn stamina for the sake of burning stamina just to get stats that I got for free in CBT1. If they want to keep this stat system, there needs to be a way to guarantee main stats, or hell, even substats, for example, Punishing Grey Raven has set main stats and you can auto clear and use event currency to buy what you need for any desired slot. Then you can either choose to roll substats with stamina, but through weekly game modes you can gain currency from memory USBs that guarantee your substats, so eventually you'll have a perfect build. Or even Honkai Star Rail has self-modeling resin to guarantee your main stat. Basically, gear is too RNG right now and in my opinion it's a bit too much and should be simplified or have a way to guarantee stats. This leads to another problem that I have with the ecosystem, which is the grind. Almost every gacha game has a time efficient way to farm gear, clearing some sort of stage or domain to get the gear, and some games even have auto clear. So if you're low on time, most games you can log in, burn your stamina quickly by clearing the domain, and call it a day. In the Withering Waves second closed beta test, the equivalent are these tacit fields. They can drop the tuners that you need to unlock the substats, and will have a 50% chance to drop random echoes for the set bonus you want. The problem is that the rewards are not worth the amount of stamina or time to clear the domain, even with an invested team. Yes, it drops a few guaranteed echoes for the set that you want, but is it the right rarity? Is it a non-duplicate echo? Is it the right main stat? Did it roll the right substat? That's not always the case. So it's better to run around in the open world killing monsters for echoes until you run out of spawns. It gives a better chance for you to get the echo that you want with the right main stat. But if you're busy and you don't got the time to run around farming echoes every day, your echoes are likely going to be dog water. This isn't a massive deal since you can clear harder content with subpar gear if you play well enough and level up non-RNG aspects like skills, passives, or ults, but the better or proper gear makes it a lot easier. And the other major issue is unleveled echoes can't be fed into other echoes for XP, so you just end up with an inventory full of useless echoes that you can't get rid of. Meaning the only way to level up your echoes is with stamina, and it takes a lot of stamina to max out one level 25 gold echo, almost more than a day's worth. 
And finally, when you feed a leveled Echo with substats into a new Echo, you lose all the substat tuning material that you used for it since it doesn't get refunded. So I can't believe I'm saying this, but I actually prefer the Genshin or Star Rail gear system compared to the current iteration of the Echo system in the second closed beta test in Wither Waves. It's actually wild to me how they downgraded the Echo system from CBT1 to CBT2, but I've been ranting way too much about this already, so I'll stop here, but it's such a major issue I had to talk about it. So, for my ratings for the story, I'll give it a 6 out of 10. I personally wasn't too impressed with it, and it could be more fleshed out in my opinion. For the visuals and sound, I'll give it an 8 out of 10. It has the potential to be better, but it's already pretty good. And the gameplay, 9 out of 10, near perfect, the bread and butter of this game, nothing more else to say. And for the game systems, a 5 out of 10, the game is very playable, but the ecosystem needs a revamp, and it's what's keeping me from rating it much higher. Overall, Kuro games cooked like always, but maybe a little bit too hard on the ecosystem, and it seems to be the general consensus from the community as well. But I'll definitely be playing the game when it releases, because despite the flaws, I think it has a lot of potential, and I really enjoyed playing both CBTs. These criticisms, praises, and suggestions are meant to provide my feedback to improve the game based on my experience testing in the second closed beta test, because I want to love it even more, and I want everyone who plays it to love it when it launches. So, in the meantime, why not subscribe for more PGR and Wuthering Waves content, and let me know in the comments what you guys think of the CBT2 so far. Our community discord also regularly talks about PGR and Wuthering Waves, and I've also been streaming Wuthering Waves on my Twitch, plus you can catch other updates on my Twitter. And yeah, hope you guys found this interesting, and thanks for listening to me yap for this long. If you've made it this far, then I don't know, comment who your favorite character is, so I can give you my thanks. Stay safe, stay healthy, peace late, and I'll see you all in Wuthering Waves.